Hello and welcome once more to Conscious TV. My name is Ian McNay and my guest today is Pim Van Lommel. Hi Pim. Hi. And we're in Amsterdam, we're doing a day of filming here and Pim is from Holland and he's a, he was a cardiologist, he's now retired, but these days he's really interested in the relationship between consciousness and the brain and has done a lot of research into near-death experience. And he's written a book which was uh, a bestseller in Holland, that's the, uh, the Dutch version, and it's also out in English. It's called Consciousness Beyond Life, The Science of the Near-Death Experience. And he also has an important article in a journal called Consciousness of, called Journal of Consciousness Studies. It came out quite recently. So, Pim, let's start with, if you like, your story. Yes. And you were working as a cardiologist, and you were obviously faced with sickness and death a lot. And to start with, it must be quite hard to be in that situation, and you care for people, and they die. That must be quite a strain, isn't it, working in, in those conditions? Well, a lot of people survive as well. Okay. <laughs> but still, cardiac arrest and coronary artery disease and heart disease is still... A lot of people will die as well. Yes. Um, the problem is mostly when there are young people. That's harder mm. to... to and, and to have the discussions with the family when and there is a set death at young age. It's, it's difficult, it's rather yes. difficult to do. But um, cardiology has changed so enormously in the last 50 years. It, 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 it was just uh, heart disease, was just congenital heart disease and valvular heart disease until 67. And then just started the coronary artery disease and the possibility to treat it. Mm. So it's just a very young spe specialization. So, a turning point in your, in your life, in your career, was you read a book by George Ritchie. Yes. As somebody, I think, who had a near-death experience and survived that, and that got you thinking, didn't it? Yes. Well, the, the first time I ever met a patient who talked about his near-death experience was in 69. Then even near-death experience were, were not known. The terminology was... Uh, by Raymond Moody in his book Life After oh, Life I in remember, 75. Yes, yes, yeah. But I hadn't read, read it and it was not published in 69. So and we should remember that coronary care units, at least in Holland, started in 67. Before 67, we couldn't do modern resuscitation. We do, couldn't do electrical defibrillation. We couldn't do external ah. chest massage. Mm. So that was total new. Before 67, 45 years ago, all patients died with cardiac arrest. So coronary care units were total new. And, and in my, the hospital, uh, my training hospital for cardiology, I um, was just a very young doctor. And we had the third coronary care unit in Holland where I started to work. And that uh, patient had a cardiac arrest. And the resuscitation team came. I was one of them. And we started to resuscitate, resuscitate the patient. We several times did defibrillation, and after about four minutes, the patient regained consciousness. And we, at resuscitation, we were very, very happy that we succeeded. And the patient was extremely disappointed. And he told me about beautiful light and a, a tunnel and beautiful landscape. And I always say, I've never forgotten this event, but I didn't do anything with it, because I didn't know that these kind of experiences could happen in our university and also the medical study, we had learned that consciousness is a product of brain function. But what, but what was your first reaction when you, the patient told you this? Surprised. We were surprised. Mm. But I didn't know, I didn't know anything about the death experience or that it could be possible. The only thing we knew that as long as we believed that consciousness is a product of brain function, it shouldn't be, it should be impossible to experience consciousness during cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. But I forgot it. I was a young doctor, uh, in specialization, etc. And then in '86, I read a book uh, by George Ritchie, "Return from Tomorrow," where he writes uh, <coughs> about his near-death experience in 1943, 
when he died as a medical student by double pneumonia and he didn't receive antibiotics. They were not free, available, hardly available. So he died and his body was covered with a sheet. And a nurse was, couldn't accept that his young medical student died. So he persuaded the doctor to give him an inject, injection of adrenaline right to his heart, which was quite uncommon in 43. But after a death of nine minutes, he regained consciousness. And had an extremely intense death experience with many, many aspects. And as a medical doctor, he talked about it on his, in, in university to medical students. And one of the medical students was Raymond Moody. And this was also from Raymond Moody, the stimulus to start studying these kind of experiences. And he called them near-death experiences. So after reading this book by George Ritchie, I just started to ask my patients who had survived the cardiac arrest if they could remember something of the period of unconsciousness, of the period of cardiac arrest. And to my big surprise, within two years, 12 out of 50 patients I asked, and those 50 patients had survived the cardiac arrest in the past, 12 out of them told me about their near-death experiences. Mm. And then my scientific curiosity started to grow because according to our current medical knowledge, it's impossible to have consciousness, let alone enhance consciousness with the possibility of perception during cardiac arrest. Mm. So then in 88, we started a prospective study uh, in theater of 44 consecutive patients who survived cardiac arrest to find out if there could be an explanation why patients have these kind of experiences. So about the cause and content of the ND, because until that time there had only, only been retrospective studies, which means a high selection of patients who report an ND, because mostly people are silent about it, so they don't come to you to talk about it. So, so why are people silent most of the time? They sign it because First of all, it's such an overwhelming experience that doesn't fit in our current worldview that they are overwhelmed by, by, by themselves. And when they try to talk about it, they say, oh, it's just an hallucination. Oh, it's just tomorrow it's over. Uh, it's just side effect of drugs. So in the medical world, it's not accepted, these kind of experiences, because mm. we cannot explain it. Mm. So uh, th those retrospective studies is highly, is highly selective for, uh, for patients and it's very hard after 20 or 30 years to find out exactly the medical conditions where those experiences co occurred. So there had never been done a real prospective study, which means that when patients have survived the cardiac arrest, within several days we asked them if they could remember something of the period of unconsciousness. And uh, they were know that all the medical conditions, medical, the medication and all the other uh, demographic factors to find out if we could find an explanation if this patient had an NDE, if we could explain it. Mm. So you must have got more and more fascinated by this oh, because yes. once you get, okay, you get one story and as you say you were surprised, but then when you got, because 12 out of 50 is, is nearly a quarter, nearly 25%, it starts to become significant. Exactly. But that is still an aselective group of patients because yes. you just ask them, the patients I, I meet on my outpatient uh, clinic. Uh, but when you talk to patients with an NDE, if they are willing to share it with you, it's such an emotional uh, account what they tell you. And they're, they're still also very emotional. But uh, I now have met patients who had an ND 50 years ago, and when they start to talk about it, it's like it happened yesterday, with all the emotions. Really? So they, they still feel the emotions at the it's, time? It's, yeah, it's the most impressive experience of their life. Always. Wow. Yeah, always. Mm. It's always there. Mm. You, you say well, we'll come in in, in in a few minutes to actually yeah. what happens in an NDA and what yeah. some experiences were. Yeah. But I, I'm interested in pursuing first of all how the process where it changed your view of reality. And you say in the book you, it raised questions for you like, who am I? Why am I here? What is the universe made of? So it, it, it triggered something fundamental inside you, didn't it? Yes, but it's not in the first years of, of the prospective study. 
they changed slowly. Slowly. When okay. I studied more about it, when I thought more about it, when I met more and more people with NEEs. Uh, so first for me it was a scientific curiosity that it should be impossible to have these experiences. And it still happened. And later on there, come, there came all the other aspects as well. Okay. So let's go to then what actually is a near-death experience, both from the yeah. physical side and then the details of how somebody has the experience of it. Yeah. Well, uh, so sometimes people report an extraordinary conscious experience during a critical medical situation, like a cardiac arrest. And the, the death experience is the reported memory of this exceptional conscious experience with universal elements, uh, like uh, being out of the body. Don't ha they don't have any physical pain anymore. They have the idea, is it dead? I'm dead or not? And when they, are, when they have an out-of-body experience, they have the possibility to have uh, a perception out and above the body, and they perceive their lifeless body with a resuscitation or operation or, or traffic accident, whatever. And then sometimes they can come in a dark room and go through a tunnel to the light in an otherworldly dimension with beautiful landscapes and beautiful colors, beautiful music. Then they can meet a light or a being of light. And with this being of light, there is unconditional love and wisdom. You get all the answers before asking the questions. It's incredible for them. And in this atmosphere of unconditional love, they see your life review, that they relive the whole life. And I'll come to it later. Sometimes they can see a flash forward, a preview of their future life events. They then can meet deceased relatives and come through a border. And at last, they have a conscious return into their sick body, which is awful for them. So these are the universal elements. And, and this, uh, the death experiences are reported in cardiac arrest or patients in coma, through traffic accident or uh, uh, cerebral hemorrhage. Uh, you can have it uh, uh, shocked or uh, blood of, uh, loss of blood uh, around uh, childbirth, young women. You can have it in near drowning for children. You can have it in uh, severe traffic accident, which is a fear death experience, so you're not really dead. You can also have it in uh, Severe disease is not really life-threatening. And you can have it in, in, in uh, let's say, severe depression or meditation or in isolation. So you don't need a non-functioning brain to have this kind of experiences. They have been mentioned in all times, in all cultures, in all religions. Uh, Plato has written about it uh, 2,000 years ago, the soldier of Arab, who had a classical in the NDE, and it has been described in the Upanishads, the Hindus and the Tibetans. So I didn't know that all, uh, at all. The, the mystical or religious experiences in the Middle Ages also have this kind, described as the, the same kind of experiences. So I'm, I was going to stop you there because yes. the, the, there's a lot of experiences you, you've covered. And, and yeah. so the first, the first stage of possibility is that they leave their body. Yeah. So let's say consciousness has left the physical body and, and I know some of the accounts in the book, you talk about they're in the operating theatre and they can see their body, they can see the nurses and doctors around the body, and so they're like observing what's happening to their body. So that's one stage. And that's similar, I guess, to a, a, an out-of-body experience. People will have that's an out-of-body experience yes. where they can leave their body and see, not yeah. only their body, they can travel and look at other places yeah. or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. So you've got that. Then you've got, for some people, the process where they then go further through a tunnel yeah. and they see a light and then they might also then see dead relatives, what they feel are dead relatives, mm. and can communicate with them. Yes. And then you also mentioned um, about memories of their life and also about a possible future. So tell me more about that, wh how you see that, because... You, what, what do you want to hear about the... But about the memories The of, memories. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, they experience that 
all acts, all words and all thoughts you ever had are kept with the influence of okay. others. Okay. So it's, it, it's, it's like I see with all seeing eyes, you experience every act from the past, either as a young child or as a baby. And you experience also what happened to the people surrounding those acts. So when you took some plaything from your, from your little sister, you feel how awful it was for her. You feel her sorrow. So you're connected with everybody in the past as well. And you see that if you gave love or you didn't give love, which is the most important thing when they come back. Uh, it's about the intention of your thoughts and words and acts, which is important, trying to give love. So it's a life inside experience as well. You, you really experience how you lived. Uh, and it's an insight. It's, it's no condemnation or whatever. But you, you know now how you lived and how you should change if you would love to do it better. So your inside experience, so through that, as you say, you then have some kind of ability to see where you could handle things different in the future if you come back, how yeah. you would have a different way of handling the same experience and living your life. Yeah, but what they experience that you're connected with everybody else, and this connection. connection is always there. You're also also still connected with disease relatives. You're always connected. So it's it, sometimes people tell me it's about uh, an experience of unity, an experience mm -hmm. of oneness. And when they come back, they still have this same kind of feeling that you're connected with everything and everybody, and with the planet Earth, with nature, whatever, you're always one with them. Mm. You see, I'm going to come back to my previous question to yeah. you about the effect this had on you. Yeah. Because here you are a conventional doctor, cardiologist, yeah. and you're medically trained. And to have this possibility open to you is so different from the way you've lived your life, I presume, and also your training. Yes. It changed me a lot. It yeah, took a lot of you, but it changed, it changed me a lot. I think I've, I always say that people with an ND who, who were willing to share the experience with me were my greatest teachers. Yes. yes. It must be very touching also to... It's very touching. It's yeah. very emotional. And they're so reluctant to share it with you. Yeah. When I ask, do you, do you remember something from the period of unconscious? Then they say, no. Or you say, why? And then you know it will take at least an hour. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. So they're shy, I suppose, and they... Oh, very, because all the negative responses they get. Yes. There's so much prejudice, uh, so many comments they get about these kind of experiences. For most medical doctors, it's impossible that they have these kind of experiences. So they don't accept it as well. Yes. It doesn't fit in our ideas. So I always say that this kind of experiences where you listen to those patients, where you hear hundreds and hundreds of those patients, and I've written accounts of more thousands of those people, then you have to reconsider again the never proven assumption that consciousness is a product of brain function, because mm -hmm. that consciousness would be a product of brain function. It should be impossible to have an enhanced consciousness uh, during cardiac arrest with self-identity, with cognition, with emotions, with possibility of perception, uh, with memories and also impossible to have the conscious return into the body. So it's impossible with our current medical knowledge. Mm. So that was a challenge for me as well. And you also said in the book I thought was interesting was that the people that had these experiences, most of them lost their fear of death. Yes. Because obviously they've had an, an insight into what possibly happens when they die. So they realize they're not just rooted to this body in this lifetime. She said, death happened to be not death at all. It was another way of life. So there's no death anymore for them. It's, there's, there's no death for them. No, no death for them. Mm. So they, they are convinced that there's a continuity of their consciousness. Yes. They're convinced of it. Yes. Yeah. Because they experienced it. Yes. They know. <laughs> it's not a belief anymore, they know. 
Yeah, I'm looking for a quote here from the book that I, that I wrote out that one person said, my body, my life, and the whole world suddenly hit me like a prison. Yeah. So that was interesting. Yeah. So they realized the restriction of the physical form, and not only the physical form, but the, the, the mental attitude of society and their emotional restrictions. Yeah. Well, when they have the conscious return into the body, they have a huge problem because they are too much extended in their consciousness to fit in this small body, which still has the problem with the disease as well. When you had a heart attack, you have to pay it again. When you have a, a traffic accident or when you have a cerebral hemorrhage, they have so many limitations in your body. And you, have, you were just a few minutes ago without any limitations at all. Mm. Now there is, you were saying in the book, a small percentage of patients that find it frightening. Yes. Well, first of all, let's say that what we found in our study of 344 consecutive patients who survived cardiac arrest, that 18% of those patients reported clear memory and near-death experience of the period of cardiac arrest. And 82% did not have any memories at all. Mm. So the first thing we wanted to know could it be an explanation why only 18% have these memories, this near-death experience? Um, to our big surprise, there was no difference at all between the group of patients with and without an ND in the duration of cardiac arrest, two minutes or eight minutes, to just uh, how much lack of oxygen there was in the brain. Didn't matter at all. If you was unconscious for five minutes or three weeks in coma, didn't matter at all. They give a medication didn't matter at all. Uh, you have some, sometimes an electrophysiological stimulation in the cath lab where you resuscitate patients after induced cardiac arrest within 30 seconds. Didn't matter at all. Uh, Pre-knowledge about this kind of experience, fear of death or religion, education, didn't matter at all. So the surprising finding in our study was that until that time, it was always said this kind of experience are just caused by lack of oxygen in the brain. They're just hallucination, just side effects of drugs. It's just psychological explanation. We could tell now, because we could do statistical analysis in this study, that there is no explanation why people have this NDE. And we could exclude physiological, psychological, pharmacological explanations, which was very important. Mm -hmm. And then we found all the classical elements. In our study, we didn't find uh, frightening NDEs, but I know quite a few of patients who had a frightening uh, NDE. Uh, but first of all, about 15% of patients who have a positive NDE have a frightening moment when they are in a dark room. The, the dark room is frightening, and then they see a small point of light where they're attracted to, and they describe as a tunnel or a spiral or something. So the, staying in a dark room is frightening for them and then later it becomes positive. But perhaps about one or two percent of those patients stay in this dark room or go down, like Dante has written in this Divine Comedy. They can describe the same things as Dante has written. Mm. And when they come back, they're not, they're, they are afraid of dying again. Mm. Yeah. And so it really does change people's lives, doesn't it, when they get back? Yes. So the, the second part of our study was a longitudinal of long-term study to see if the changes of the people described, let's say the transformation, which is the loss of the fear of death, a new life inside, what is important in life. Important in life is unconditional love and compassion, first towards yourself, mm -hmm. accept your own negative aspects as well. This is hard enough that unconditional love and compassion towards others and towards nature and toward the planet Earth. And the third aspect of transformation where they're very reluctant to talk about is to enhance intuitive sensitivity, which means that they feel what other people feel or think, which is awful for them. They're connected with other people. So what we wanted to know, if this kind of transformation is due to the cardiac arrest itself or due to the NDU, that hadn't been studied before in a prospective design. So what we did is, after two years and eight years, we interviewed all patients with NDE who survived with a match control group of patients who survived cardiac arrest without NDE. And what we found is, 
only patients with an ND had this transformation, mm. which is important because it is the objective part of the subjective experience. You can never prove that someone has a subjective experience. We cannot prove what you think or what you feel. But we can prove the objective transformation. And we found that only the patient with the ND had this classical transformation, which is very intriguing as well. Yeah, and also it's interesting when you, when you, when you say that they feel what the other person's feeling, yes. and that's unsettling for them. Yeah. I guess it's unsettling because it's unfamiliar to them. It is totally unfamiliar. It's mm. totally new for them. The enhanced intuitive sensitivity, we, we can perhaps come to it later, we can uh, try to explain it now as well. Um, the question is, where is our consciousness? Let's, let's talk about it now. That's, that's, yes. that's the interesting thing. And then thing, we can right? explain later yeah. this enhanced intuitive sensitivity. Yeah. Uh, we know and that's the important aspect of this prospective studies in patients with cardiac arrest, because they all have been clinical death. And clinical death is the period of unconsciousness when uh, heartbeat stops, blood pressure stops, and breathing stops. And you have to resuscitate them within five to ten minutes, otherwise the brain is so uh, damaged that they all will die because of irreversible dream. It's the, first stage of dying. They're all dying, these patients, and you have to be very uh, <coughs> alert to start a CPR within several minutes, otherwise you are too late. Mm -hmm. So these patients, when we look to these patients, then we know that the clinical findings, that they lose consciousness within, within seconds. When you measure the blood flow to the carotid arteries, it's zero within one second. There's no blood flow going through the brain. The clinical findings are the, the body reflexes are gone, which is a function of the cortex of the brain. The brainstem reflexes are gone, which is the gag reflex or the corneal reflex of widened pupils who don't react to light anymore. The breathing stops, the breathing center is close to the brainstem. So the clinical findings are there's no function of the total brain anymore. And there have been studies done in induced cardiac arrest in humans, let's say for threshold testing in internal defibrillators, ICDs, or in animals as well. And when you measure the electrical activity of the brain, of the cortex, the EEG, you find that within 15 seconds the EEG is flatlined. So there's no electrical activity anymore. So what we know from the clinical findings and these kind of studies, the brain function has ceased within 15 seconds. And no patients will be resuscitated within 20 seconds. It's always at least 60 to 120 seconds. In a well-organized CCU and on a cardiac ward or out of hospital arrest, it's even much worse. So in all the studies, there have been four prospective studies with a total of 562 patients who survived cardiac arrest. We found the same percentage of NDEs, and we found, and we know that all these patients must have had a flatline EEG and no function of the total brain. So then, with our current uh, medical knowledge, we, 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 we believe that consciousness is a product of brain function. So it should be impossible that patients should have enhanced consciousness with the possibility of perceptions and memories, etc. It's impossible, but it still happens. Mm -hmm. So we have to change our ideas about the relationship between consciousness and the brain. And uh, in my concept, the brain has not a producing function, but a facilitating function, which means that it makes it possible to experience consciousness in your body, which is a waking consciousness. And this is only a small part of this enhanced consciousness and in this enhanced consciousness that people experience, there's no time and no space. It's a non-local realm, what we know from quantum physics. Everything is there at the same time. Everything is always connected without time, without space. No beginning, no end. There's no beginning nor end to consciousness. So this non-local consciousness or endless consciousness is always there and we receive just when we awake just a small part of this consciousness as our waking consciousness, and a small part of these memories as our memories we can know. But 
the brain has a transceiver function. It transcends the information from our body and transcends information from our sense organs to our consciousness. And we receive information from consciousness into our body. It's a kind of interface function. It, you can compare it also with your computer. There are one billion websites also here in this room at this very moment, but you need an instrument to receive them. And you can yes. change the websites as well, but you know the codes. So the one billion websites are not produced by your computer. They're received by it. And, and, and also the, the, the mobile telephone, there are hundreds of thousands of more mobile telephone calls now going through this place where we are here. But we need an instrument to receive it. So what, you, what you're saying is that the brain is like a computer or a television set, yes. which on the one hand is receiving information from our consciousness. Exactly. And on the other hand, it's feeding back to the consciousness yeah. the, the sensations that we have. Exactly. Which begs the obvious question, where is our consciousness? Yeah. You've mentioned non-local. Just explain more what you mean by yeah. non-local. Well, you can understand it when I ask you the question, where are those one billion websites? Well, they're, they're, they're in a... <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the stored in a desert somewhere in America. Well, they're just encoded in electromagnetic informational waves. Yes. So they're always there. And the, information the information is stored somewhere tangibly, isn't it, on a drive yeah. somewhere? So it's, so it's trans transmitted by the speed of light. But it's kind of non-local, you can understand that you, about the same time, not the same time, about the same time, you can receive these one billion websites in Australia and China and Europe and the United States. It's always there. It's encoded in waves. And so the non-local consciousness is also encoded in waves, but there are scalar waves, waves is some, uh, something else. Uh, this non-local realm, the, everything is there, encoded. And we just can tap from this. And maybe we have more reception ability. The threshold of consciousness can be lower. And it is lower when you had an NDE, which means that you not receive only channel one, your own consciousness, but you also receive channel two, three, four, five, the consciousness of others. And this is what I call the enhanced intuitive sensitivity. You receive information, not by your senses and not by your body. It's non-local information exchange. And this is the enhanced intuitive sensitivity. People can have prognostic feelings, premonition. They can know that someone will die in three weeks. And to the surprise, they will die. And you know, most people know about an incoming phone call. You, you think of someone, the, yes. the, most people have this. But this is also no local information exchange. But yes. you can feel the sorrow of people. You feel the pain of people. You can know that they have cancer. You don't want to know it. So when they have had an NDE and this enhanced intuitive sensitivity, they stay at home because when you go in, in public transportation, transport, you feel all those people there coming in. So they're very, having this NDE, which is a positive experience, is a trauma. It is a spiritual crisis, which, which is a cr trauma. They have homesickness for this beautiful experience, mm. but they're depressed because they cannot share it with others and they feel overwhelmed by this enhanced intuitive sensitivity. So they're lonely as well. And it takes years and years and years to accept it. And, and the second stage is yeah. to integrate it, to change your life as well. And you say again in the book that it's very helpful to have relatives or friends who are sympathetic and understanding, yes. because otherwise they feel even more isolated. And, and that's the practical problem as well, because mm. most friends, relatives, are not open for it. Yes. it, it, it the effect is that more than 50% of patients with NDE get a divorce because the partner says, it's not the same per person I was married with for the last 20 years. It's totally, it has, he isn't interested in money anymore. He's interested in, 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 in power anymore. Uh, he he wants to help people. <laughs> it's not the same <laughs> person. So they get a divorce. And, and uh, so it's a real Practical, about 85% of, of physicians are not open for it. Mm. Nurses are a bit better, happily. And it takes years mostly to find a person who is open and willing to listen. And you need to share it to accept it as well for yourself, because you cannot accept it yourself as well. And you, you think you're crazy. Mm. 
when you, as long as you don't know that this is called a near-death experience, these kind of experiences are possible, you think you're crazy. And you feel things, you, you're crazy. So you're so totally changed. I still want to go back to pursue yes. this question of where is the consciousness yes. stored? Now, I yeah. understand you used the word non-local and you've explained briefly what that is. But how, how, do, you have a, do you have an understanding or the beginning of an understanding of how it works insofar as you, Pim, have got your history and experiences somewhere it's stored? Yes. We, know, we, know, we know with websites and everything else, we yeah. know somewhere it's, it, it's, it's stored on a hard drive somewhere. And, we, and, and through a wire or through the air, we're getting that information, yes. But how's it working with us as human beings? Yes. Well, I, I was trying to, uh, to understand it when I talk about the gravity fields, which influence our solar system and influence the whole universe. We don't know what it is. We cannot measure it. We only can measure the physical effects of gravitation. It's the same, but it is all in the whole universe, there's gravitational fields. So also the consciousness is everywhere in the universe. And we only can measure the physical effects by neuroimaging techniques like fMRI or PET scan or EEG. But we cannot measure consciousness itself. We cannot measure the content of consciousness. We cannot measure what you think or what you feel. So with the current uh, materialistic science, neuroscience, it's not possible to prove that you have consciousness or that I have consciousness. Mm. And that's the reason the materialistic scientists call it and just consciousness is an illusion. Because, because we cannot measure it. So when this non-local domain, non-local realm, is not in this physical world. It's outside. It's another dimension, like gravitational fields. It's always there. Could this be dark matter or dark energy, which they're now just beginning to discover and quantify a little bit? The problem is we cannot measure it. We can't discuss it. Let's also, let, 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 you, 20 years ago we thought we knew everything about the universe, and now we know 4% is well known and 90s. 6% is dark matter and dark energy, we don't know what it is. We thought that we knew what DNA was. We know only 4% of DNA is important for, for uh, proteins. And 96% is called junk DNA, because we don't know what it what really is, is doing. I don't believe that nature makes junk. Mm -hmm. So it has a function. For me, DNA has the, the local interface function in each cell. So each cell of our body has contact with this non-local field as well. It's always there. Mm. And uh, so this interface function changes, is enhanced when you had a near-death experience. And uh, so the threshold of consciousness, it's always, William James one century ago already mentioned this threshold of consciousness and uh, people like, like Frederick Myers from England uh, Henri Bergson, the philosopher from France, have written this. It is nothing new. And, and, and Plato has written about it, and the Upanishads, 5,000 years old, have, have written about it. It's nothing new. People have always known it because of this kind of experience, have been there during all times, all religions and all cultures. People have always had this kind of experience. So people knew it. And with our current fantastic medical science and, 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 and uh, materialistic science. We have learned a lot, but we've missed a lot as well. Yes, the thing that we do know now, and you would talk about this in the book, is that the brain could not possibly, there isn't enough capacity in the brain to hold all the information from all the experiences that we've had. No, no. So physically that throws out the, uh, the, the, the theory that, that our mind is in our brain, and our brain stores all the information. Exactly. That cannot be the case. And a very interesting aspect as well as neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is that by changing your consciousness, you can change the function structure of your brain. So talk more about that. So it's what you call scientifically non-local perturbation, but means that the consciousness has effect, has influence on matter. Uh, when you do long-term meditation, the structure and the function of your brain is permanently changed. We know what by EEG. 
but also a short-term meditation gave, gives rise to changes. There's been an interesting study done in England by London taxi drivers. They had to learn the London plan. That's right, yes. And, and, and it's about three years of hard study to know it. And they, when they got a scan, they saw that the hippocampus, the part where the, it plays a role, is just a correlation, a role for, for, for consciousness, was all in all these patients were enlarged. It was become bigger because they have used it more. Yes. Where you do, it's also interesting, mindfulness training. You change your structure and the function of your brain. Interesting also placebo effect, where you give patients with a Parkinson disease, a placebo, and they believe that they get medication, they improve. You see more dopamine in the brain, you see them moving better. You see the change in the brain by fMRI and PET scan. Where you do chronic pain patients, you give them a placebo and they believe that they get the real medication. You see changes in the brain mm. exactly the same as they got the medication. Mm. And when you do it in depression patient, they're really depressed and they believe that they get medication. You see changes in the brain also with, with the compulsive disorder. There have been interesting studies done. So you can change the function and the structure of your brain, neuroplasticity, by changes in your consciousness, which is very, and that could never be possible when just conscious of project of brain function. Yeah, it seems there's two parts for that. For that. There's the belief system and then there's the focus as well, because you may mention about placebo effect, which is more the belief system. It's, it's, which is it's also a treat. change of consciousness. It's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a, a belief. In a way. It's, it's, you, you think something in your consciousness. Yes. And it has influenced your brain. Yes. Now, this, this is a question, maybe it's going to another level. Where is that thought ultimately coming from? Because we've established that... You mean where consciousness is coming from? Where is the thought to change something yeah. coming from? It's always there. But it, it's, it, let's say, uh, you also ask, why do we receive or have this waking consciousness? Uh, the personal consciousness. When you have a mobile phone, you have a code in it. And that's the reason you only receive your personal phone calls. Yes. So you have also a code in your body, which for me is the DNA. Each person is unique and each DNA is person-specific. So this is your code for your person-specific consciousness as well, which is a part of this huge whole of non-local consciousness. Yes. But I'm wondering, you see, where the motivation comes from, the, the, mo the personal, yep. the individual, the motivation relating to the human being comes from. So I understand, it, you know, it's interesting, with the taxi drivers, um, I forget the word they use for it. For the, they call it the knowledge. I think they call it the knowledge. The the um, and they do have incredible knowledge because you get in a taxi in London. You would probably know this when you uh, go there. They don't. And you say a street, <laughs> and they nearly always know where it is unless it's in the outskirts. They Which is incredible. <laughs> it is incredible because a lot of them you start talking to them, and and you know they're they're. they're their knowledge of the world is quite limited. They'll take, they all talk about football without, almost without exception, and they'll talk about current affairs or whatever, or their wives and everything. But you don't think these are people with great brains, yet they, they, you're right. They have learnt this knowledge, and it's interesting that you, you can quantify that in the brain. No that shows... Hippocampus, yeah. It shows in the brain. Yes. And also for musicians, you see changes when they're fighter players or pain. You see changes in the brain. Mm. These parts of the brain are larger than my or your brain. Yes. Because they train it. Yes. The music, they train the muscles, but they train the music as well. There's, yes. there's some parts are, are larger. Yes. Yeah, and I think it's uh, it, Bruce Lipton talks about this. He calls mm. it epigenics. And Epigenic he, is somehow something oh, else. Good, explain that then. Yes. Well, how's it different? Well, uh, we always thought that since Darwin, that everything is genetic. It's in your DNA. I believe the DNA is the interface, 
the transceiver. So DNA can change. They open or close uh, connections in the DNA by influences from outside. This is called epigenetics. So where you have influence by your environment, by your grandfather, by your parents, grandparents, it will change your DNA, which can be inherited by your children as well. So mm -hmm. epigenetic means that influence from outside change your DNA, which is genetic. So it's, it's, it's not just uh, inside your DNA. It also is influenced by outside factors, and this is I've written about it as well in my book about right. epigenetics. Yes. It's a very interesting aspect that we are connected with our environment as well, and it changes also our body, not only our brain, but also our body, also our DNA. Yes, that's what is called epigenetics. But it, ca it comes down to the fact that we have a power to change our potential. Exactly. And that's the fascinating thing, and that's what a lot of us, including myself, forget at times, yeah. that we, there is an inherent and, power there. And that is uh, the unconscious aspect, like, like epigenetics, it's not conscious, but you can also consciously change it by meditation, mindfulness, or whatever. Yes. So, by training yourself. Yes. I was looking at my notes, so I wanted to cover some other things because yes. I know time is finite and we have to finish in about 10 minutes, but I, I still want to get as much as I can in this program. And you also mentioned in the book that in a way the near-death experience and, and, and the concept of non-local and endless consciousness, that explains, explains things like deathbed visions, which we cover with the program with Peter Fennick on Conscious TV, heightened intuitive feelings, which you've talked about a little bit, and also remote viewing, which I've always found fascinating. And I read this book a few years ago where... Stephen uh, the, Schwartz, by Stephen Schwartz. It was, wasn't Stephen Schwartz, it was somebody else. It was oh. somebody who uh, had worked for the US military and had this... Put off. Yeah. I don't remember, but he, he'd, he'd been, yeah. he'd been shot. It was friendly fire, he'd been hit on the head and he was wearing a helmet, so it didn't kill him, but it changed something in, in, in the way he saw reality. And then he, he, he had all kinds of powers, including remote viewing. He had a near-death experience, I'm quite sure. Yes. Must have had. So yes. it changes your reception ability, what I said. Well, first, when you have the end-of-life experience of deathbed visions, uh, that people can have, in the end stage of their disease, can have also this period of enhanced consciousness. They are they see the diseased partner or diseased parents coming to get them. They see a light or a tunnel of light. Sometimes children who are dying see angels. Uh, the difference with the death experience is that they have at the same moment their waking consciousness and this enhanced consciousness, so they can talk about it at the same moment. Mm. When you're unconscious in cardiac arrest, you cannot communicate about it, but in end-of-life experience you can communicate about it. And they sometimes just say, oh, what a beautiful light, and then they die. So they have the same kind of experiences. And sometimes, there's a recent book by, by um, Raymond Moody, Shared Death Experiences, that people who are at the deathbed of a loved relative who dies, that they are taken with their consciousness, with the death experience of this dying relative, and they go also through the tunnel, through the light, sometimes see the life review of the, of the people, of the, 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 the person who just died. Mm. But the body is still at the, at the bedside, and then they still come back with the consciousness in, in, the, in the body again. And they're just normal, healthy people who are, by the love of the dying patient, are taken with the death uh, experience, which is the same as the near-death experience the content. And what also can happen is the perimortal experience, that you are seeing someone or feeding someone who is dying at a, at a, at a distance. I know a story from a woman who was in a Japanese concentration camp in the Dutch Indies in Sumatra, and her husband was in a Japanese concentration camp in Java, and in the night her husband came to her and said, don't worry, 
I'm fine. And then six months later happened to be the exact death moment of her husband, which is a pretty mortal experience. Some mm. people come to visit you to comfort you. And then you have the post-mortal experience or after-death communication, which is perhaps a greater taboo than a near-death experience. Uh, people who are in contact with the consciousness of deceased relatives in the days, weeks or months after their death, mostly during sleep, but it's not a dream because you never forget it. It's also a life-changing experience and they can see them or feel them or communicate with them. And there have been some studies, for instance, in the British Medical Journal, that 50% who uh, have lost their partner have contact with them. And when you lose a child, it's 75%. When I give lectures, so many people are sitting there because they have this kind of experience and they mm. cannot believe it themselves. But this life, they sometimes receive information that couldn't be known. So it's also objective information mm. they receive. And then the remote viewing, I call it non-local perception, which is you can perceive, not by your senses, not by your body, from a long distance. And that is what people with it enhanced intuitive sensitivity also can do. You can see things in the future. So it's independent of time and independent of space, of distance. So you can see, see also, they have been with uh, remote viewing, they found in Egypt all uh, uh, graph tombs they didn't know, but they could see also back in time. So it's also non-local perception. And they used it for the CIA many times, but R Russia did it as well. No, yes, yeah. yeah. So this kind of, it, let's say, when you have the concept the idea of non-local consciousness, it's all so simple. It's yes. just you have, have contact with these non-local aspects of consciousness. Then you have the non-local perturbation, neuroplasticity, non-local perception, which is remote viewing, and then intuitive sensitivity, which is the, what you call telepathy, whatever. But it, for me, it's an old-fashioned terminology. You shouldn't use it anymore because people don't believe it, it's called paranormal, but it is normal where you have a different kind of approach, scientific approach. Yes, it just proves more and more that we're basically these receivers. Yes, and, and, and that we well. have a body. Yes. We and we are conscious. It's our vehicle. So without a body, we still are conscious beings. We still have conscious experiences, and yes. that's what be, someone wrote to me. I can be without my body, but my body cannot be without me. So you need yes. a connection. Yes. <laughs> but there's right. no connection anymore. Your body and death is just the end of your physical aspects. Yes, it's it's just a continuity of consciousness, and that's yeah. what I've learned from all those people who had a near death experience. Yeah, it actually the more I talk to you, I, I, the more I realise that how we die is very important somehow. It's. Our ideas about death define how we live our lives. Mm -hmm. So we, 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 when we think that death is the end of everything, we invest in the materialistic external aspects of our life. Mm -hmm. But when we know there is a continuity, we invest in what is really important, which is love and compassion and empathy towards others and toward our, towards our endangered planet as well. Yes, and as you said earlier, we also have a realization that we are all we're expression of the same thing. And everything you have done to others will come to you back as well. Yes. The positive as well as the negative aspects. Yes. You meet them all again when you die. Yeah. Pim, I'd like to go on, but I'm looking at the clock and we need to finish. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's been fascinating and it opens up so many other doorways to look at reality. And it's such important work that you're doing and uh, Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Appreciate you also coming to talk to us on Conscious TV. And thank you everyone for watching. Remind you, Pim's book is called, in English, Consciousness Beyond Life, The Science of the Near-Death Experience. And of course, as we've discussed, the, um, the ramifications of what he talks about are pretty mind-blowing in many ways. Thank you for watching, and I hope we see you again soon. Goodbye.